Hi, Nick Rains here. Let's have a look at how I've been using the Leica Q and the Leica Q2 in my recent documentary work. All right, so this is the Leica Q2. Um, I've used the Q extensively. The Q2 less so because it's only been out for a relatively short period of time and they are actually quite hard to get your hands on. They've been very popular, which is great for Leica, of course. But for me, trying to get my hands on one to uh, have a look at uh, proved to be a little bit tricky. But anyway, I did and I did take it to Antarctica recently and I've got some pictures um, in my slideshow, which we'll talk about in a little while. But just a couple of things about the features. Um, you can get all the technical specifications off the Leica website, of course, but 47 megapixels, that is an enormous amount of resolution. And the question is, do you need it? Well, I would argue that because this camera uh, is so easy to use and so quick to operate, there's no downside to having 47 megapixels. So absolutely, it's a great thing. Because if you ever did want to make a nice big print, like some of these ones behind me or even bigger, you'd be able to do that easily. So it's not like you're paying a price for the 47 megapixels in terms of the camera's functionality. You wouldn't know whether it was 24, 47, 60, or whatever. It just still operates. So separating out the resolution and the camera's actual operability uh, means that you can be a bit more objective about your buying decisions for certain, you know, for sure. So 47 megapixels is just a good thing. No downside to it. So let's get that out of the way. Second thing is the uh, operability of the camera. And much like the Q, um, and there's very little difference between the Q and the Q2, we've got an extra dial here with some custom functions and uh, it's a dedicated dial for exposure compensation. It's also uh, IP52 rated for dust and moisture, which the Q wasn't, but otherwise it's fundamentally the same camera. The menu's been updated, uh, the firmware's been updated, the sensor's been updated, obviously, but it still has that same lovely point and shoot feel. Now, it's a 28 millimeter fixed lens with the option to crop the shots to different focal lengths. Now, it crops the JPEG output applies a metadata crop to the DNG files, which means that when you first open that image in Lightroom, you'll see the cropped image. But if you go to the crop tool, you can uncrop it. So the raw file is still the full angle of view of the 28 millimeter lens. It's only the JPEGs which are cropped or hard cropped to a final result. So you can kind of have your cake and eat it, which is great. Um, super light, uh, good battery life. Um, Really, if you know anything about the Q, you will jump straight into using this without any qualms at all. It's, it's, it's so similar. The autofocus is really snappy. I mean, it, it locks on. But the really good thing about it, or one of the really good things about it, is that when you go into manual focus, as soon as you move the focusing ring here, it magnifies the view in the viewfinder so that you can critically focus on something. And you can even follow focus because this is a mechanical focusing ring, which is unusual on modern cameras. A lot of them are electronic, so that the signal generated by this moves, the, it changes the focus. It's not actually mechanically connected, whereas this one is. So you've got that sense of being connected to your focus point. And there's a particular shot in one of my Cuba pictures, or some of my Cuba pictures uh, for the, of the dancers, where I'm actually following the focus, and the viewfinder is sharp enough, so that if you turn the magnification off, for when you focus, you can see the focus point moving as you move it here. And you can actually follow the focus of the moving dancers, which I found astonishing for a modern camera. Very few cameras can do that these days in manual focus. You always feel a bit disconnected from the focus point, which is why, of course, we have really good autofocus. But autofocus isn't always the right tool for the job. And sometimes I miss that mechanical focus feel. Well, this camera has that, which is really excellent. Okay, enough about the camera itself. Let's look at some of the pictures that I've been shooting with this camera and I'll talk a little bit about uh, how I got them and why the camera worked in my favor when I was shooting those images. The first place I went to with my Q was Cuba. And for street photography, I think you'll agree that the kind of camera that the Q is intended for, the kind of person the Q is intended for, is going to use it in a lightweight point and shoot situation, street, travel, documentary, and so on. 
And when I went to Cuba, we went to this nightclub to see some of the old Buena Vista Social Club uh, jazz players performing. And the queue was the ideal camera to take along. It was busy, it was hot, it was noisy. I really didn't want to be taking a full bag full of camera gear with me. So I simply put the queue over my shoulder and headed out. This is a panoramic shot, not a single shot. So I've taken maybe five pictures with the camera held vertically um, from left to right and just shot them handheld. High ISO, probably 1600 ISO, certainly shot at f1.7. And yet as a panorama, it is very successful. And here's that f1.7 lens, the, the Summilux f1.7 28 millimeter lens on the Q and the Q2 is a beautiful piece of glass. And it does allow you to get that lovely, lovely out of focus background that you'd normally associate with a, a more telephoto or even a 50 millimeter lens used wide open. So it's, uh, it allows you to separate that background out. And this shot shows it up beautifully. It's still at 28 mil. I think all of these pictures I've shot with the full angle of the, uh, the lens. There's a few pictures towards the end of these slides where it's a little bit different, but almost all these ones are shot at 28 mil. And you can see that lovely fall off. Slightly different subject. This is back in Australia. This is more your classic wide angle view with those lines converging strongly, which is obviously the sign of a wide angle lens. I've also exaggerated it a lot by getting very, very close to the sand. I think I was probably maybe 12 inches above the sand level there. Um, I would have shot this at quite a uh, narrow aperture for maximum depth of field, but also you can get these sorts of pictures. And it's hard to believe that this picture and this picture are taken on the, the same camera with the same lens and the same angle of view. They're both taken on the 28 millimeter lens, but this one's taken at f1.7 and very close and that limits the depth of field dramatically. So you've got more of a macro look. And the previous shot obviously is more of a traditional wide angle view. Insides are great. This is a, an old pub in um, South Australia somewhere, I believe. And this sort of shot is your bread and butter of a camera like this. It might be uh, when you just have stopped for lunch, you pull over and you find somewhere really interesting and you just happen to have the queue over your shoulder. You don't need to get your whole bag of tricks out of the car. You can just get shooting with this, this camera and you're, you know you're not going to be compromising your quality. Even aerial shots. This is a nighttime shot of Brisbane, shot at 3200 ISO and f1.7. And it, I've got a print of it. In fact, there's, a, there's actually an image on the wall behind my head as we speak. Uh, I'll just show you that. If I can just cut back. Look, it is there. And cut back to the slides. And it, it's just, it comes up beautifully. There's a little bit of noise deep in the shadows, but you, you would never pick it as a 3200 ISO shot. And if anybody's ever shot out of a helicopter with the door off, you'll know it is not an easy place to shoot from. So the Q handled it beautifully. Still on the Leica Q, this is a portrait session that I actually set up at a one of those one of those historical villages that you can go to, and these guys were demonstrating blacksmithing. So uh, I set them up for a group of students so that we could demonstrate portraiture. And again, I've used it at f1.7. That's a 28 mil lens shot, and it kind of has a look of a telephoto lens, doesn't it? That's because the background is out of focus because I've shot it at f1.7. Now the other thing about the Q with it being so small and versatile, is you could actually shoot without looking. This is at Holi in India. And as you can see, it's not a very good environment for a camera. So I had the camera in a plastic bag and I was effectively waving it around, hoping, I say that's not quite right. I was aiming it with a, uh, the intention of getting the shot that I had in my mind, but I wasn't looking to the viewfinder to focus. I was relying on the camera's autofocus doing the job for me. And I was holding it high above my head to get away from the, the crowds of people because I'm not particularly tall. If I was six foot six, I'd be, have a big advantage, but I'm only about five foot 10. So when I'm in a crowd, I'm at the same level of everybody else. So being able to hold the camera up and make a reasonable a stab at where you were pointing it and let the autofocus and the auto exposure do the work for you it was a huge advantage and i yeah i did come up with some reasonably successful pictures i mean this shot here is the focus is absolutely nailed on the guy in the middle and yet this is with the camera held at full extension above my head in a seething crowd of people and with bits of water and paint flying everywhere so well done like a cue for doing the job the Q2 is weather sealed. Uh, however, I would probably still put it in a plastic bag because whilst it would survive the conditions better than the old Q, I really don't want purple paint all over it. 
For portraits, again, f1.7 uh, is what I would use. And I'm talking a lot about that widest aperture, aren't I? Uh, that's because I use the camera almost all the time at 1.7. Why wouldn't you? It's what it's designed for. It's only when I absolutely want more depth of field will I actually change that aperture. So for me, f1.7 is by far my most commonly used aperture, even with a shot like this. That um, It's a little hard to see in a small picture here, but that corridor behind the old gentleman here uh, really falls off in sharpness and it makes him stand out in three dimensions. Russia, I put these images in because the queue, as this was shot on, is very easy to hide away when the weather conditions are bad. And it's very, it was a very wet day, a lot of rain. And when I shot this picture, it was pouring down. So I was able to keep the queue in a small bag hanging around my neck and only um, pull it out when I found when I found something to photograph, like this Russian fisherman. And if you look carefully on the right, you might be able to see the little lines that are the rain whizzing past almost horizontally. So not easy conditions, but the Q managed just fine. These last few pictures are taken on the Q2. I had the opportunity to go down to Antarctica at the beginning of the year. Uh, which is 2020 as I say this, and I used the Q2 for the first time. I hadn't had I hadn't actually seen one before that. Classic Q shot, 1.7 aperture. You can see the distant horizon is out of focus and you can see the foreground is out of focus, but the captain and the second in command are actually nice and sharp. Uh, ideal for the sort of images where you really don't want to be lugging large amounts of camera gear around. It was just a quick trip to the bridge to see what was going on, grabbed a few shots like this of the, the map table. And yes, they still have paper maps on these high tech ships. They, uh, they rely on the GPS to a certain extent, but they always have this as a fallback position just in case. Now I put these last two pictures in, not because they're award worthy images, just to show you the difference between 28 millimeter angle of view and 75 millimeter angle of view. Now this is a genuine crop. And I think I mentioned it before, you do crop the data. So if you're shooting JPEGs, you end up with about seven megapixels worth of image. But if you're shooting RAW, you actually get the full image with a crop uh, in Lightroom, which you can then uncrop to get the full angle of view. But it's not a genuine change of focal length. It's a crop from 28 millimeter. But seven megapixels is easily enough for almost all uses up to uh, about A4, maybe A3. Certainly anything to do with viewing images on the internet or on an iPad, not a problem at all. So feel free to use it. You won't notice too much difference unless you make a really big print and then, you know, fair enough, 47 megapixels would be nice. All right, I'll just switch back to, to me here. I hope you enjoyed seeing those images as much as I enjoyed shooting them. If you have any comments on the pictures or the camera, please feel free to leave something below. In the meantime, my name is Nick Raines. Thank you for watching.